certain man and say to him, The master says, My time is near at hand. At thy house I am keeping the Passover with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus bade them, and prepared the Passover. Now when evening arrived, he reclined at table with the twelve disciples. And while they were at the table eating, Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. But they began to be sad, and to say to him one by one, Is it I? But he said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips into the dish with me. The Son of Man indeed goes his way, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It were better for that man if he had not been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And taking a cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is being shed for many. Amen, I say to you, that I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I shall drink it new in the kingdom of God. After reciting a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It was about the season of the Passover. Now the Passover, you will recall, takes its name from the fact that uh, when the Jews were in bondage in Egypt, in order to release the Jews, God punished the Egyptians. They were to lose their firstborn. But in order that the destroying angel would not touch the firstborn of the Jews, the Jews were asked to sacrifice a lamb and to sprinkle the blood of the lamb above the doorposts, not on the earth where it could be trampled upon. The destroying angel, seeing that blood as a promise and sign of redemption from slavery, would pass over that house. The sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb became known as the Passover. The Jews continued to offer the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb at the season of Passover. And in the course of centuries, hundreds of thousands of lambs must have been sacrificed. Remember that even before Moses, Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he loaded his son Isaac with wood and told him to carry the wood which was preparatory and necessary for the sacrifice up the mountain. It was the symbol of God the Father offering his son. As Isaac was the only son of Abraham. So our Lord, the son of the Heavenly Father. And when finally Abraham and Isaac got to the top of the mountain, Isaac asked, Where is the lamb? What are we going to sacrifice? God provided a substitute for Isaac. That too typified the fact that our blessed Lord would in some way substitute himself for our sin. But the point is that Isaac asked, Where is the lamb? Abraham said, My son, God will see to it that there is a lamb to be sacrificed. And Deus providated, God will provide a lamb. With this memory of the sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac, with a memory of the Passover season and all of the lambs that had been sacrificed. The Jews were now at this Passover season going up to Jerusalem. Every family was to have its own Paschal lamb. One can therefore imagine the banks of the Jordan almost being white with the fleece of the lambs that were being brought up to the city in order to be sacrificed. The Jews understood the meaning. It was a recall and a memory of how they were rescued from political slavery. And they were also told by the prophets that it was to be a symbol of being rescued from spiritual slavery. In fact, our prophet Isaiah had told them that when the true Lamb of God would come, that he would be a man. Isaiah had written, and God laid on his shoulders our guilt. The guilt of us all. A victim? Yes, he himself bows to the stroke. No words come from him. The Lamb was the sacrifice. And Christ would be the sacrifice. Notice John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God. He was not the people's Lamb, nor the Lamb of the Jews, nor the Lamb of any human owner. The Lamb of God. And when the time came for that Lamb to be sacrificed, he would not be a victim of those who were stronger than himself, but rather he would be fulfilling his own willing duty of love for sinners. It was not man who offered the sacrifice, although it was man who slew the victim would be God himself.
And they came to a country place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he himself withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And kneeling down, he began to pray, saying, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven to strengthen him. And falling into an agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And his sweat became as drops of blood running down upon the ground. And rising from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to Peter, Could you not then watch one hour with me? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And while he was yet speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, that is he. Lay hold of him and lead him safely away. And when he came, he went straight up to him and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. There is only one recorded time in the life of our blessed Lord when he sang. And that was after the Last Supper when he went out to his death. He then told his apostles that they would all be shaken during this hour. Remember that our Lord always spoke of his crucifixion and his sufferings in terms of hour, his glory in terms of day. Evil has its hour, God has his day. As he entered that garden into which he had often gone to pray, he told his apostles that they would be scandalized in him that night because the shepherd would be struck. And they were scandalized indeed. For a short time after the agony, they fled. But he told them, however, when he went in, I will go before you into Galilee when I have risen from the dead. Such a promise was never made before, that a dead man would keep an appointment with his friends after three days in the tomb. Though the sheep would forsake the shepherd, the shepherd would not forsake the sheep. Is that a lost the heritage of union with God in the garden? So now our blessed Lord ushers in our restoration in the garden. Eden and Gethsemane are two gardens around which revolve the fate of humanity. In Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, Christ took humanity's sin upon himself. In Eden, Adam hid from God. In Gethsemane, Christ interceded with his father. In Eden, God sought out Adam in his sin of rebellion. In Gethsemane, the new Adam Christ sought out the father in submission and resignation. In Eden, a sword was drawn to prevent entrance into the Garden of Eden and thus immortalize evil. In Gethsemane, our Lord told Peter to sheathe the sword that he had carried. Now there are two elements that are bound up together in this agony. Sin bearing and sinless obedience. He goes afar from his apostles, about as far, the scriptures say, as a man could throw a stone. What a curious way to measure distance. Our Lord threw himself upon his face, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass me by. Only as thy will is, not as mine is. Notice how the two natures of our Lord are involved here. He and the Father were one, though he did not pray, Our Father, if it be possible, if this time has passed. But my Father, unbroken was the consciousness of his Father's love. But on the other hand, remember that he's man as well as God. His human nature recoiled from death as a penalty for sin. It was very natural for human nature to shrink from the punishment which sin deserves. So the prayer to have the cup of passion pass was human. In other words, the no was human. The yes to the divine will was the overcoming of that human reluctance to suffering for the sake of redemption. So in obedience now to the Father's will, our Lord takes upon himself the iniquities of all of the world to become a sin bearer. There never was a sin committed in the world for which he did not suffer. The sin of Adam was there. When as the head of the humanity, he lost for all men the heritage of God's grace. Cain was there, purple in the sheet of his brother's blood. 
The abominations of Sodom and Gomorrah were there. The forgetfulness of his chosen people who fell down before false gods were there. The coarseness of pagans who had revolted against the natural law. These pagans were there too. All sins were there. Sins committed in the country that made all nature blush. Sins of the young for whom the tender heart of Christ was pierced. Sins of the old who should have passed the age of sinning. Sins committed in the darkness where it was thought the eyes of God could not pierce. Sins committed in the light that made even the wicked shudder. Blasphemy seemed to be on his lips as if he had spoken them. And from the north and the south, the east and the west, the foul miasma of the world's sin rushes upon him like a flood. Samson-like, he reaches up and pulls down the whole guilt of the world upon himself as if he were guilty, paying for the debt in our name so that we might once more have access to the Father. He was, so to speak, mentally preparing himself for the great sacrifice, laying upon his sinless soul the sins of a guilty world. I say every sin was there. Your sin was there. And so was mine. And is it any wonder then that they began to pour from his body drops of blood fell upon the ground like beads forming a rosary of redemption. Sin is in the blood for the remission of sin, blood had to be poured forth. He was guiltless. Prayed and suffered in our name. Then came Judas. Our Lord had to understand even false brethren. Judas threw his arms around the neck of our blessed Lord and blistered his lips with a kiss. The cohort, therefore, and the tribune and the attendants of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. And they brought him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who had given the counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. The high priest, therefore, questioned Jesus concerning his disciples and concerning his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why dost thou question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. Behold, these know what I have said. Now when he had said these things, one of the attendants who was standing by struck Jesus a blow, saying, Is that the way thou dost answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken ill, bear witness to the evil. But if well, why dost thou strike me? And Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin were seeking witness against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. For while many bore false witness against him, their evidence did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We ourselves have heard him say, I will destroy this temple built by hands, and after three days I will build another not built by hands. And even their evidence did not agree. Then the high priest, standing up in their midst, asked Jesus, saying, Dost thou make no answer to the things that these men prefer against thee? But he kept silence and made no answer. Again the high priest began to ask him and said to him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said to him, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his garment, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is liable to death. Then they spat in his face and buffeted him, while others struck his face with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, O Christ, who is it that struck thee? And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders, the scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate therefore entered into the praetorium, and he summoned Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Dost thou say this of thyself, or have others told thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own people and the chief priests have delivered thee to me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would have fought that I might not be delivered to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Thou art then a king? 
Jesus answered, Thou sayest it, I am a king. This is why I was born and why I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they persisted, saying, He is stirring up the people, teaching throughout all Judea and beginning from Galilee even to this place. But Pilate, hearing Galilee, asked whether the man was a Galilean. And learning that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who likewise was in Jerusalem in those days. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had been a long time desirous to see him, because he had heard so much about him, and he was hoping to see some miracle done by him. Now he put many questions to him, but he made no answer. Now the chief priests and scribes were standing by, vehemently accusing him. But Herod, with his soldiery, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arraying him in a bright robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate then took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers, plating a crown of thorns, put it upon his head and arrayed him in a purple cloak. And they kept coming to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him. Pilate therefore again went outside and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus therefore came forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When therefore the chief priests and the attendants saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. The procurator said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they kept crying out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Now Pilate, seeing that he was doing no good, but rather that a riot was breaking out, took water and washed his hands in sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Our Lord is now made a buffoon during the night, as he is also tried before two religious judges, Annas and Caiaphas. In all, our blessed Lord was tried before four judges. Two of them were religious judges. They belonged to the Jews. Two were civil judges, Pilate and Herod. Pilate was a Roman, a Gentile, and Herod was an Edomite. The judges could not agree on why he should be condemned. Different charges were made in different courts. In the religious court, our blessed Lord was condemned of blasphemy. In the civil court, our blessed Lord is condemned of treason. Before the religious judges, he is found to be too religious, too divine, too unworldly. Before the civil judges, he is found to be too political, too human, too worldly. They cannot agree on why he should be condemned. They can only agree that he should be. And simply because he is to be condemned on contradictory charges, one because he's too divine and the other because he's too human, where would there be a fitting punishment except the sign of contradiction, which is the cross? Let us take a brief scene from each of these trials. The trial before the religious judges. Caiaphas was unable to find any reason why he could condemn our Lord. He introduced false witnesses, but the witnesses could not agree among themselves. Caiaphas finally resorted to an oath. He put our blessed Lord under it, and with all of the sternness that he could muster, and annoyed by all the contradictions of the witnesses that he had heard, he said to our blessed Lord, I adjure thee by the living God to tell us whether thou art the Christ the Son of God. Now when Caiaphas asked that question, if he was the Christ, the Son of God, remember that his mind was not like ours. When you and I hear the word Christ, we go back to his earthly life, not Caiaphas. Caiaphas was going back to all of the prophecies. He was going back to the book of Genesis. He knew how the Messiah had been foretold. And so the question was, was he the Messiah? Was he the Son of God? Was he clad with divine power? Was he the Word made flesh? Was it true that God, with sundry times and in diverse manners, spoke to us through the prophets, in these last days, was speaking through him the Son? And so he asked, Art thou the Son of God? And our Lord answered, 
I am. With sublime consciousness and majestic dignity, he announced that he was the Messiah and the Son of the Living God. And when he said, I am, I'm sure that Caiaphas remembered that when God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, those were the words that God used of himself. I am. Who oh, am? Our Lord now speaks to Caiaphas again. Says, moreover, I tell you this, you will see the Son of Man again when he is seated at the right hand of God's power and comes on the clouds of heaven. Notice our blessed Lord affirmed his divinity, then his humanity, and both under the personal pronoun I. He is telling Caiaphas that someday he will be judged. Caiaphas now finds our blessed Lord guilty. He rends his garments as a token for the fact that he had heard blasphemy because Christ was making himself God. But Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and the people could not put our blessed Lord to death. That power belonged to the Romans. And so they hustle our blessed Lord as the prisoner off to Pilate. He has several trials before Pilate, and Pilate sends him off to Herod. But it is interesting to note the charge that is brought before Pilate against our blessed Lord. In the trial of any ordinary human being, there is a continuity of charges. Our blessed Lord was found guilty of blasphemy. Now, when the prisoner is brought to a higher court, you would think that he would still be condemned to blasphemy. But he's not. Why not? Well, because if Caiaphas and his friends told Pilate that our blessed Lord had made himself God, Pilate would laugh at them. Pilate was a pagan, he would say, I have my gods, you are yours. I sprinkle incense before mine every morning. They therefore had to find some other charge. Now the charge that they would bring against our blessed Lord would be treason. He would be too political, he would be too human, he would be too early. It must be remembered too that Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin hated the Romans. The Romans had conquered their country. Roman judges were seated in judgment. Roman coinage was in their pockets. Caesar's ancestors were all over the city of Jerusalem and all through the land that was holy. They hated the invader, they hated Rome. Now when they bring our blessed Lord before Pilate and he asks what charges do they bring against the man, they said that they had found him guilty of perverting the nation, refusing to give tribute to Caesar. Refusing to give tribute to Caesar. Caesar whom they hated. Pilate knew that they did not love Caesar, but in order to win their release, after many incidents in the trial, they finally said to him, Thou art no friend of Caesar if thou dost release him. The man who pretends to be a king is Caesar's rival. Pilate was afraid of being reported to Rome. What would Tiberius do to him? Would he unseat him? But Pilate tried to save our Lord. He had called our Lord innocent seven times. Now he scourges our blessed Lord, brings him up before the people and says, Behold your king! And up against that marvel, Pilate's fader came away with voices saying, We have no king but Caesar. Then Pilate gave up Jesus into their hands to be crucified. And bearing the cross for himself, he went forth to the place called the Skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the center. And Pilate also wrote an inscription and had it put on the cross, and there was written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews, therefore, read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. The chief priests of the Jews said, therefore, to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And they gave him wine to drink, mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Now there were standing by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. And when the sixth hour came, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which translated is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished and that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, 
I thirst. Now there was standing there a vessel full of common wine, and having put a sponge soaked with the wine on a stalk of hyssop, they put it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is consummated. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he expired. Our Lord is now led to Calvary. Once on those heights, he offers his hands to his executioners, the hands from which the world's graces flow. The first dull knock of the hammer is heard in silence. Mary and John hold their ears. The sound is unendurable. The echo sounded as another stroke. And then the cross is lifted, slowly off the ground. Then with a thud that seemed to shake even hell itself, it sank into the pit prepared for it. Our Lord has mounted his pulpit for the last time. He spoke seven words, as to say seven times. The first word of our blessed Lord was, for all who had crucified, and all who had brought him to death, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It is not wisdom that saves. It is ignorance. And then after hanging three hours on the cross, our blessed Lord now prepares to surrender his life. Remember that he had often said, no man takes my life away from me. I lay it down of myself. It is to be noted, therefore, that when our blessed Lord came to the seventh word, the scriptures say that he spoke those words in a loud voice to show that he was the master of his own life. So now he who is the prodigal son who left the father's house, wasted his life and his blood for our sakes, is preparing to go back home, and he lets fall from his lips the perfect prayer. Father, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. There is a rupture of a heart, and a rapture of love bows his head and dies. The Jews, therefore, since it was the preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things came to pass that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall you break. And again another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Now after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, because he was a disciple of Jesus, although for fear of the Jews a secret one, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave permission. He came therefore and took away the body of Jesus. And there also came Nicodemus, who at first had come to Jesus by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes in weight about a hundred pounds. And Joseph bought a linen cloth, and took him down, and wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of a rock. Then he rolled a stone to the entrance of the tomb. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea come to take him down from the cross, and bound him in a hundred pounds of spices. And it is interesting what scripture says. In the same quarter where he was crucified, there was a garden. The word garden hinted at Eden in the fall of man, as it also suggested through its flowers in the springtime the resurrection from the dead. In that garden was a tomb in which, in the language of scripture, no man had ever been buried. Born of a virgin womb, he is buried in a virgin tomb. And as Crashaw said, and a Joseph did betroth them both. Nothing seems more repellent than to have a crucifixion in the garden, and yet, there would be compensation, but the garden would have its resurrection. He was born in a stranger's cave, and so he is buried in a stranger's grave, because human birth and human death are equally foreign to him. 
Dying for others, he's placed in another's grave. His grave was borrowed, borrowed for he would give it back on Easter, as he gave back the beast which he rode on Palm Sunday, when he said, the Lord has need of Now late in the night of the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and drawing near, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment like snow. And for fear of him the guards were terrified and became like dead men. But the angel spoke and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen even as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord was laid, and go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen, and behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Behold, I have foretold it to you. And they departed quickly from the tomb in fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, saying, Hail! And they came up and embraced his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, take word to my brethren that they are to set out for Galilee. There they shall see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and had consulted together, they gave much money to the soldiers, telling them, Say his disciples came by night and stole him while we were sleeping. And if the procurator hears of this, we will persuade him and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been spread abroad among the Jews even to the present day. But the eleven disciples went into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus drew near and spoke to them, saying, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. rose from the dead. He made many appearances, and one of the appearances of the resurrection was a week after. All of the other apostles had seen our blessed Lord. They had been become convinced, but only after much evidence and after much doubting. And our blessed Lord comes into the upper room and says, Peace be to you. Now Thomas had refused to believe. Thomas, one of the apostles, he said, I will not believe until I have seen the mark of nails on his hands, until I have put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hands into his side. He will never make me believe. Our blessed Lord appeared. Peace to Thomas. Let me have thy finger. See? Here are my hands. Let me have thy hand. Put it into my side. Cease thy doubting and believe. And throwing himself on his knees, he said to the risen Savior, Thou art my Lord and my God. Oh, there are some who will never believe even when they see. Thomas thought that he was doing the right thing and demanding the full evidence of sensible proof. But what would become of future generations if the same evidence was to be demanded of them? Suppose you would not believe the resurrection until you could put finger into his hand and hand it to his side. The future believers, our Lord implied, must accept the fact of the resurrection from those who have been with him. Our Lord thus pictured the faith of believers after the apostolic age, when there would be none who would have seen it, but their faith would have a foundation because the apostles themselves had seen the risen Christ. How do we know about the resurrection? Simply because the church was there. The church was there with the apostles. They saw the resurrection. Thomas was there, the daughter. Thomas believed. And he believed in the name of all who could not see sensibly, but could accept the testimony of those whom Christ sent out to preach the gospel of the resurrection to all nations. Now he led them out towards Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, as he blessed them, that he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. 
and they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. When God came to this earth, he took upon himself a human nature. That human nature, we said, was thrown into the fires of Calvary in reparation for the sins of man. Risen, it now ascends. So that there is a continuity between the incarnation and the ascension. In the incarnation, our Lord took a body, yes, but not just a body to suffer. Otherwise, it would have taken it for a time. If he took that human nature, just in order to suffer for our sakes, why did he not divest himself of that human nature? After all, his garments had been soiled and stained. They had borne the heat and burdens of the day. Why not throw them off? No, because human nature was taken not just to atone for our sins. The end and purpose of God coming to this earth was to bring us to perfect union with the Father. And how could he do this? By showing that our flesh is not a barrier to that intimacy. By taking it up to heaven itself. By showing that those who pass through trials, suffering, whatever they be in this life, misunderstanding, will have their body glorified. By sharing in Christ's cross, we share in his glory. The goal of all humanity is in some way reached in the ascension. That's the full beauty of our Lord returning again to the Father. He brought back with him something that he did not have when he came to this earth. He brought his divinity, yes, he took his divinity back with him. But he also took something else back. He took back the human nature. Now that he's taken this human nature, now that it is in glory at the right hand of the Father, what does he do there? Has he a work? Certainly. He's a mediator. We might almost say that he's constantly showing his scars to his Heavenly Father. And he's saying, see these, I was wounded in the house of those that love me. I love men. I suffered for them. Forgive them, Heavenly Father. He is our sacrifice. He's ever present before the Father. The scripture puts it, ever making intercession for us. You see, we very often get a wrong understanding of the life of our blessed Lord. We think of him as just living on this earth, preaching the Beatitudes and suffering. No, our blessed Lord did not come down just for that. He is living, making intercession for us. The representative of all who invoke him. Certainly, he has finished the work of justice on earth because he paid the debt of sin, but the work of mercy in heaven is unfinished. That goes on and on. And the reason it goes on is because we need his intercession. For it now is that our blessed Lord took upon himself a pattern human nature. That human nature was something like a die that a government makes when it wishes to mint coins. When the die is fashioned, Millions of coins can be fashioned like unto it. Christ, our pattern man, was born. He suffered. He overcame temptations. He rose from the dead and was glorified at the right hand of the Father. We are the coins. Because he was born, we are to be born. Not physically, but spiritually. Because he denied himself and suffered, we are to deny ourselves. The cross becomes the condition of the empty tomb. Once our life is patterned upon his crucifixion, then our life shall be patterned also upon his glorious resurrection and his glorious ascension. Are we his coins? He will ask for coins and he will say, whose inscription is there on? Is it Caesar's? Do we belong to the world? Or do we belong to God? May it be so. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation of the classic reflections of Bishop Sheen as much as we have enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm Matthew Arnold, wishing you a joyous Easter season from our family to yours. As part of our thanks for purchasing this talk, we've added a short bonus segment of another popular talk from Lighthouse, which may help enrich you in your faith life. 
Here is Father John Karabi. Jesus, having loved his own, loved them to the end. Jesus, having loved you, loved you to the end, the bitter end. He suffered and he died. And he was laid in a tomb. The tomb was sealed. Darkness surrounded the light of the world. We know that Jesus descended to the dead. He went to the dark abode of the dead Sheol, there to announce the good news. Imagine the apostles and the disciples on this holy Saturday, the one that they had placed all of their hope and trust in, the one that they believed to be the Messiah, the anointed of God, he was dead. He was placed in a tomb, and darkness surrounded him, and darkness surrounded them. Sometimes we in the church feel like we are beset by a kind of darkness that is very cruel. Sometimes, like the Lord, we might cry out from our cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The times we live in are not easy times. These are times of great strife, times of struggle. Indeed, the hour of evil has arrived. We do struggle with the powers of darkness. We look at the state of the world. We behold a spectacle unparalleled in the history of creation. Oh, you may say, but Father, many things were wrong. Even when our Lord walked the earth, the world was pagan after all. Yes, and the world then didn't have 2,000 years of Christianity to answer for. We have had 2,000 years of the teaching and presence of Christ. That is no small thing. Yes, the pagan world was filled with immorality, violence, but we've had 2,000 years of Christianity. In my own lifetime, half a century, I've seen a radical movement. When I was a boy in this country, it was a very Christian atmosphere. The very air you breathed seemed to be Christian. Now, just a few decades after that, we have reverted to a kind of neo-pagan culture, a culture of death, a culture which seems to be saturated with impurity. Evil is having its hour. We look around and we see this spectacle of abortion. Tens of millions of the most innocent, brutally slaughtered. Euthanasia, the word means merciful death. Our old people, now have to worry that someone might be merciful to them. Today, perhaps you decide, tomorrow perhaps a family member, after that, who knows? Some government official? The spectacle of impurity, unbridled sensuality, drugs, alcoholism, tremendous disparity between the very rich and the very poor, violence, gang violence, wars compounding everywhere, a dark, dark spectacle. We look at the world and we remember the darkness of the tomb. And then we cast our gaze inward. We look at the church. And those of us who love the church grieve over the church. If you know what's been happening, lo, these several years now, you grieve over the church. For there is darkness that has entered even inside the very sanctuary of God. Immoral theology has been taught in certain seminaries and Catholic universities for many years. I said immoral theology, not moral theology. Universities, colleges, high schools with the name Catholic, it's a travesty. Things that have been long held to be mortal sins, objectively taken, or called to be normal human behavior artificial contraception, sexual relations outside of marriage, masturbation, you name it. Now all of a sudden, moral theology has changed in its essence. Darkness. Doctrinal errors. Someone may have told you that, oh, Jesus isn't really present in the Eucharist. It's a sign, a mere symbol. Right? It is the Lord. It is the Lord. And the emphasis shifted from the Lord to the people. The people are important. We are the body of Christ, yes. We are the body of Christ, but I tell you this, you won't be the body of Christ unless you receive the body of Christ. And he's more important than we are, for he is the head of his mystical body. And unless you've lost your head, 
realize that Jesus is the one who's in charge of his church. Teaching on the Blessed Mother, going from light to darkness. When I was a boy, we didn't hear any theological errors. There was no attack on Our Lady. You didn't hear theologians dare suggest that there might be an error in the teaching concerning the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, the assumption of Our Lady into heaven. And if you ask the average Catholic, is she the mediatrix of all grace? No eyebrow would raise, of course, of course. The teaching concerning the Holy Father. Everybody loved the Pope, all Catholics loved the Holy Father. They wouldn't question his teaching. We hadn't yet gained that much arrogance. But now, many think nothing of criticizing, attacking, condemning the teaching of the successor of St. Peter. Darkness. Sometimes we feel like we're in the tomb. In the liturgy, we wonder sometimes what happened. Oh, many good things happened in the last 30-some years, but some not so good. It was good to throw open the windows to allow the fresh air, especially the breath of God, to come in, to open the church to the world, to give the world the benefit of the church's teaching. But as one Cardinal Archbishop said at the Council, be very careful that you do not cross a line. For yes, it is good that we be open to the world. The world is good, meaning the world as creation, the world as the theater of redemption. Indeed, let us be open to the world and give the world everything we have to offer. But do not confuse that with the world as a spirit. The spirit of the world is something else. And if that foul wind comes in through the open windows, look out. Bishop of Bruges, Belgium, made that intervention at the Second Vatican Council. It was prophetic. And so we look at some of these things and we wonder what is going on. Sometimes we feel alienated, discouraged, even despondent. Indeed, the darkness closes in. And we're in that dark place with Jesus. We have to remember that. He suffered, he died, he was buried in that tomb. The darkness closes around his mystical body, and we are tempted at times to lose heart. The devil's great weapon is discouragement. I see it everywhere I've experienced it myself. The evil one wants to discourage us. He would have us believe perhaps that it's all gone, our church is falling apart, that we'll never have a celebration of the Eucharist with the kind of reverence that we used to, of course, where we now find ourselves as a contradiction to that. We can and do have reverence in the contemporary celebration of the Eucharist. But many places we have problems. And so we have to be strengthened. We have to strengthen each other. We have to remember that, yes, there is a passion. Yes, there is a death. Yes, there is a going down into the darkness of the tomb. But there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection. The dawn is coming. This is Holy Saturday, and the Lord is about to rise. <laughs> We hope you have enjoyed this presentation brought to you by Perusia Media. We offer a wide variety of CDs and DVDs on scripture study, apologetics, spirituality, family life, and much more. To request your free catalogue, write to us at Perusia Media, PO Box 33, Belfield, New South Wales 2191. Feel free to call us at 02-8730-8874 or visit us online at www.perusiamedia.com. That's P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A-M-E-D-I-A dot com. Thank you very much, and God bless you.